Okay. Thanks very much for having me here. Um, so I'm Ryan Briggs from uh, the Micro Devices Laboratory at JPL, uh, co-worker of uh, Carl Yee, who spoke earlier. So um, yeah, my talk, I'll talk a little bit about uh, indium phosphide etching and, and etching of related epitaxial materials. Uh, but mostly I'll talk about our development of low dissipation quantum cascade lasers and sort of the applications and device results for those. So um, first off, I just want to acknowledge the members of the laser group at JPL, as well as uh, collaborators of ours at a company called Pindar Technologies in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, who work with us on our quantum well active region designs for our lasers. Um, project support comes from NASA for, from planetary science uh, programs. And then we uh, use sort of in equal parts the JPL uh, Micro Devices Laboratory clean room as well as the Caltech k and clean room here, which I'll uh, show you etching results from there today. So the, the motivation for our work is to develop uh, low power consumption, long wavelength semiconductor laser sources. And these are for a class of instruments um, that we call tunable laser spectrometers, or TLS instruments. They're an in-situ instrument that we want to bring to a, a, a location, in this case, planetary atmospheres, in order to do uh, measurements of uh, abundance and even isotopic composition of, of atmospheric molecules. Um, but because these things are on spacecraft, the, the power budgets for them are, are limited. Um, so that means when you move to longer and longer wavelengths, uh, even with relatively low power semiconductor laser technologies, uh, commercially available devices uh, tend to com consume too much power. And that's especially true, true when you consider the laser chip itself plus uh, the cooler that you need to maintain a, an operating temperature for the laser. So we've developed a process. Um, grab the laser. So we've developed a process to, develop, to uh, fabricate devices that, that basically look like this, um, where we can make very narrow laser ridge waveguides, which limits the amount of current we have to drive through the device. Um, it also allows us to get away from epitaxial regrowth, which has advantages from a processing perspective. And we can integrate uh, sidewall gratings to make distributed feedback single mode devices. So I'll, I'll tell you about that. Um, just as way of an introduction to our applications, um, what I've plotted here is just line strength for various molecules, gas phase molecules, um, that are of interest for planetary science. Um, I'll show you a Mars TLS instrument that was designed to, to use lasers to measure uh, water, CO2, and methane. Uh, but for future missions, uh, scientists want to move into this 4 micron plus uh, wavelength range, and so that requires uh, lasers that are able to access those absorption lines uh, within power constraints. A little bit about the, the technique that we use. So plotted here is just a simulated transmission spectrum for a mixture of, of typical air at atmospheric pressure in this case with 10 parts per million of carbon monoxide around 4.8 micron wavelength. And this is over a 25 centimeter optical path. Um, so basically, you see you have about 1% transmission dips due to absorption in these uh, carbon monoxide molecules. So a lot of uh, spectrometers for measuring gas concentrations uh, have a broadband light source, and then you spectrally resolve what you detect and try to resolve these little dips in transmission. What we do is we take a single wavelength source and tune that, so that way our detector just has to be you know, sensitive over at least that tuning range, and we can kind of trace out the shape of these absorption lines. And the depth of them tells us something about the concentration, and the width changes with things like total pressure and the kinds of molecules that, that our target molecule is mixing with. So there's, there's a lot of information to be gained there. So if you look at a, a typical laser characteristic, um, this is for one of our quantum cascade lasers, lasers operating. Uh, in fact, this, this one that I'm showing the emission spectra for here has a typical IV characteristic, but if you look at the current versus, or the power emitted versus current, it has some threshold, and then an approximately linear regime, which is where we're operating. Um, as you increase the laser current, it heats the active region, and through thermo-optic effects, that causes a redshift in the wavelength. 
So that's how we get this tunability. It's not much tunability, but it's enough to, to tune across these relatively narrow absorption lines. So if you look at, uh, th these are our measurements from a, a spectrometer we built. So if you have a detector, um, you'll see an increase in power as well as a little bit corresponding to tuning across your target absorption line. We also use a, a wavelength modulation technique where in addition to slowly scanning the current of the laser, we have a, a lower amplitude high frequency modulation. So basically this laser line is, is oscillating back and forth as it tunes across the line. We demodulate, in this case, at the second harmonic of that modulation frequency, and we basically get the second derivative shape of that line. And that's really just a signal processing technique to get better signal to noise. So you can see that this can be a powerful technique, but it all depends on having uh, this laser source available. Um, so a little, a little bit about the space science. Uh, it's ho hopefully interesting. Um, on the Mars Curiosity rover, which ha has been up on Mars for almost five years now, uh, in the belly of the rover there is this TLS instrument. And it's a, a two laser uh, instrument. Uh, there's one at 2.8 microns and one at 3.3 microns. These lasers go through some beam splitters and calibration cells, and then they go into a multi-pass region where they accumulate many meters of optical pass length. Um, Martian air is sucked into this chamber. Martian atmosphere is about six millibar pressure, um, so less than 1% of Earth, uh, and it's actually pumped down to about a tenth of that pressure. So the absorption lines become very narrow for these target gases. And uh, that allows, and that plus the, the path length allows um, this instrument to resolve not only the relative abundance of these different molecules, but also isotopic composition. So, so it's, a, it's a very powerful technique. Um, the 2.8 micron laser can tune across these water and CO2 lines, and the 3.3 micron laser across the methane lines. I just want to point out the, the total power budget for this instrument. I mean, it's, it's relatively minuscule, just a you know, a couple of tens of watts. Um, so that, that really places a constraint on the kinds of technology that you can put on these, these platforms. Just a little bit about the results, because it's cool. <laughs> so uh, this instrument has allowed scientists to do an in situ measurement of the Martian atmosphere. And, and really, uh, they've been able to get unprecedented accuracy on, on isotope ratios, and that says a lot about the current structure as well as the evolution of Mars. Um, these are from papers published by Chris Webster, the, the principal science investigator for, um, for this TLS instrument. So basically what, what he would showed is that mass spectrometers on previous uh, landers as well as spectroscopic measurements done using Earth-based telescopes were, were kind of way off when it came to looking at things like uh, carbon-13 isotope ratios. Um, and then he was also able to, to really nail down the D to H ratio, so deuterium to hydrogen ratio in the Martian atmosphere. When it comes to methane, this is a, a, a neat result because, of course, the presence of methane might uh, indicate the presence of organic, you know, decaying organic material on Mars. And, and really what was found is that most of the time, so a soul is a Martian day and there's about 600 some souls in a Martian year, and over the course of the year, most of the time, there's really no methane to be found. But sort of there's the seasonal variation where there's a, an increase at the part per billion level of, of methane. And looking at things like the D to H ratio and the methane says, says something about whether these, are from, these molecules are from organic or inorganic sources. So that's still ongoing work. So in the future, um, NASA is interested in missions such as the Venus in situ explorer, where they would send a spacecraft that would drop a little atmospheric probe into the upper atmosphere of Venus. And uh, the plan is for this to have some sort of a TLS instrument that would suck in gas down to a low pressure and look specifically at sulfur isotope ratios. Uh, you can see these ratios clearly in OCS and, and sulfur dioxide molecules. And as I showed on that plot a few slides ago, um, those molecules absorb around 4.8 and 7.4 microns, respectively. So that's kind of, that kind of defines the target wavelength of the lasers that we're trying to fabricate. And uh, why you'd... That was a good show.
Is that a is that a hint? <laughs> that was a really good talk, I and mean, we were doing well. <laughs> He says the system is powering down. I have no clue. 60 seconds remaining. <laughs> well? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. She he was doing a good uh, it's a great presence. It says thirty more seconds and then maybe it'll yeah. let us turn it back on. I don't know. Yeah. John pulled the plug. I don't know enough about the system to actually know what to do. Well we'll wait. Um, anybody know any good songs? <laughs> I can keep blathering if that's <laughs> yeah. useful. Yeah, I was really fascinated because I'd carry on. Uh, what's the shades? Projector control. Should be that laptop. There we go. Okay. <laughs> All right. So yeah, uh, just briefly to wrap up the link, the uh, applications part of the talk. So sulfur cycles are interesting on Venus because it, it's thought that Venus looks a lot today like Earth did over two billion years ago, where there's some evidence in the the geological record that um, there was disturbances in the sulfur isotope ratios of rocks due to uh, basically UV photons not being blocked by the atmosphere. So about two billion years ago, life formed and things like the ozone layer were formed. And so that started blocking UV radiation and the sulfur uh, isotope fractionalization stabilized. So, so it's these sorts of things that we want to study. So getting back to laser technology. Um, Basically, what I'm showing here are different laser technologies that are available in, in the mid-IR wavelength range. And really, once you get up to these longer wavelengths, uh, quantum cascade lasers are your only practical option. So uh, the, the structure of these lasers, we have a, an indium phosphide substrate, and then we grow a quantum well structure, and then an indium phosphide top cladding. Uh, the quantum well structure, uh, for example, for our lasers around 4.6 to 4.8 microns. We use uh, strain balanced uh, in gas and aluminum indium arsenide wells and barriers, respectively. And you can grow these layers in such a way that you get these little uh, inter subband gaps. Uh, for example, this just shows electron energy levels calculated for the conduction band of, of one of these, one stage of this quantum well structure um, under applied bias. And you can see that you, you basically have this, this little inner subband gap corresponding to our, our photon energy that we're interested in. And so uh, the other thing is, since these transitions occur exclusively in the conduction band in this case, you can use the same charge carriers to induce many photon emission events. So you can grow many stages of these, of these layers. So for example, in this case, we have 30 stages of, of this active region injector structure. Uh, sandwich between indium phosphide. So, um, so these are the kind of structures we need to form into to laser structures. And this just shows one of our early devices from a few years ago where we were using a wet etch to form a, a laser ridge. So it turns out that when you look at commercially produced uh, quantum cascade lasers, uh, there's one company in particular in Switzerland, Alps Lasers, and they work closely with the group of Jerome Faist, who's a professor in Switzerland uh, and one of the co-inventors of the QCL back at Bell Labs in the 90s. Uh, they still use these wet etching techniques to form their laser ridges um, to make a single mode distributed feedback laser, which requires some sort of an integrated grading for mode selection. Uh, they use typically EBM lithography and etching to put a, a grading on top of their wet etched ridge. 
They'll then overgrow that with conductive indium phosphide cladding um, and then grow, overgrow the, the sidewalls to form this buried heterostructure using insulating iron doped indium phosphide. So this is a two, so you, you have your initial epitaxial growth and then two regrowth processes that you have to do in different chambers uh, because of iron uh, doping. And so it's a, it's a fairly involved fabrication process. Plus, because of the wet etch and, and its isotropic nature, it really limits the, the minimum width that you can achieve for these laser ridges. So we decided to, to fabricate structures that look like this. So we use a plasma dry etch to transfer a pattern uh, vertically all the way through our indium phosphide top cladding and quantum cascade active region layers. Uh, then we use deposited low index dielectrics as a optical and electrical barrier layer. Um, this also allows us to integrate uh, sidewall gratings um, because we have this high fidelity anisotropic etch. And so we can get away with having a, a uh, distributed feedback laser without any regrowth steps. Uh, this calculation I show here just shows the coupling strength as a function of the depth that this grating penetrates into this particular laser waveguide structure. And, the, and really the only takeaway from it is that we can, um, with relatively modest grating depths, achieve really large coupling coefficients. So the, the inverse of this coupling coefficient really determines how long your laser cavity needs to be. So with the dry etch, we can make this ridge very narrow. And with uh, the sidewall gratings, we can make the cavities very short, uh, is, is kind of the point of this. So that you know, area that we're driving electrons through is, is minimized, and therefore the, the operating current for the laser is minimized. So I'll, I'll show some fabrication results. Um, this is a TEM uh, that was collected by Matt Sullivan here in KNI, actually. He was uh, looking for samples to, to practice doing the, the FIB extraction of TEM samples, and, and as well as the TEM itself. And, and so I gave him one of our lasers to take a look at. So you can see sort of this uh, periodic repetition. Each one of those is, is a, a stage of the quantum cascade uh, active region. This is one of our 7.4 micron wavelength designs. And uh, then what I show here is one of our early etch results where we um, used a chlorine, hydrogen, methane, ICP etching process to uh, etch through the, the active region. So this, this sort of lighter band is a, a 30 stage quantum cascade laser active region and then all the other materials, indium phosphide. There's a, a strip of metal on top that we use later in the process for electrical contact. Um, so the, I don't go, I'm not gonna go too much into the detail of this etch. I can talk to anyone who's interested in it more later. But basically, um, one of the keys to it is, is in order to volatilize the indium components in, in our materials, uh, the Sample needs to get quite hot because indium chloride volatilizes above about 200 C, I believe. So um, we increase the, the temperature of the, of the platen to 60 C, and then we also use no thermal contact to stick the, the sample down. So it's basically floating, and that causes it to, to heat in the plasma. And we get these nice uh, anisotropic results. Another feature of this etch is that it's, it's relatively non-selective. So we don't get undercutting of the indium gallium arsenide or aluminum indium arsenide wells or barriers in the, the active region. Um, however, I will say that the, the one thing we have to contend with is that the etch rate slows down considerably once we get to this active region. So we have to time the etch just right because as soon as we poke through to the underlying indium phosphide, it, it sort of takes off and we can end up with a, a ridge that's too tall. So to fabricate our distributed feedback structures with sidewall gratings, um, we deposit a low stress silicon nitride hard mask, and this is actually done with the tool at JPL, but it's also an Oxford ICP tool with a, a gas ring for doing uh, low stress dielectric deposition. The reason we do low stress is we have about a 10 to 1 selectivity of our mask uh, over our semiconductor materials. So that means to etch to a depth of, you know, we go as deep as 10 microns, we need something like a micron thick mask, which is a little bit too thick for conventional. P, CBD, nitride. Um, so we deposit our nitride, we pattern it with e beam lithography, and then we uh, do an anisotropic pseudo-Bosch etch with the, the ICP380 tool here at Caltech. 
to transfer that pattern into the, the hard mask. And then we use the hard mask in that high temperature chlorine, hydrogen, methane etch to uh, transfer the pattern through the, the laser structure in the active region. So this is a higher contrast SEM image that you can see. We've just poked through the, the active region. And you can even see some contrast between indium phosphide layers of different doping concentration. Um, after we fabricate the laser ridge, uh, we coat it in a dielectric. Um, we've done both silicon nitride and actually sputtered aluminum nitride, which works well because it has good thermal conductivity and is transparent at longer wavelengths. Uh, we use lithography to open up a, a stripe on top of the laser ridge, do a, a final metallization for top contact. And then what's shown here is a, is a completed laser device where we've cleaved a single chip. This, this laser emission facet at the end of this ridge is, is right here in this picture. And we've soldered that to a submount for, for packaging and then also wired up the laser top contact with wire bonding. So just to show some results from our lasers, at 4.8 microns, we've been able to, well, you can't really push the compliance voltage of these lasers too low because you, you need a certain number of active region stages. And there's just a intrinsic voltage drop across each of those. Uh, but as I mentioned, by reducing the area that we're driving current through, we can really push the threshold current of our lasers down. And we've gotten that down below 100 milliamps. So if you take the product of I and V, you can see we've got less than one watt power consumption for these lasers. They also operate above room temperature, which means the cooler power requirements are minimal if you're at a heat sink temperature around, around room temperature. We get nice single mode tuning, which is what we want. And we've also run these devices for thousands of hours without measurable degradation. So that's good news for space applications. Um, we've achieved similar results at 7.4 microns. The voltage is a little bit lower because the uh, you know, energy drop per stage is lower with a longer wavelength. Uh, but the threshold current's a bit higher. Um, but we still get threshold power consumption around 1 watt and above room temperature emission. Uh, we have nice single mode tuning. And then this is actually a transmission spectrum where we've shined one of our lasers through a low pressure SO2 uh, gas with a 20 centimeter path length. And, and I'm comparing the measured transmission to transmission calculated from the high trend uh, molecular absorption database, kind of the, sort of the standard database for these things. And we've got good agreement. Um, we've packaged these things with uh, small thermoelectric coolers in order to stabilize the laser temperature, because you saw the wavelength depends on temperature. Um, by operating the temperature some 10 or 20 degrees above the heat sink that this laser package is on, we can uh, basically get away with barely running the thermoelectric cooler at all to, to get temperature stabilization. So as a module, we can run these lasers with less than a watt of power. I'll say the, uh, you know, the wall plug efficiency of these devices is not great because we're only getting some 10 milliwatts of output. But that's more than enough for the application. And what's really important is just the absolute power consumption. Um, well, the one other advantage of these narrow, vertically etched ridges is that we can make the active region approximately symmetric in the vertical and horizontal directions. Um, as compared to a, tip, a typical wet etched laser ridge. And so this means our far field emission pattern is, is more radially symmetric. So we just use the two axis goniometer to measure the divergence angle of our lasers in two directions. And, and we see that it's, it's similar. So that's good for coupling to uh, you know, conventional radially symmetric optics. And we've been able to use just standard off the shelf lenses to get good beam quality and collimation of our devices. These are actual IR camera pictures. And then finally, I just wanted to mention, um, because Andre Ferran spoke earlier, uh, we did a collaborative, a small collaborative project with his group a couple of years ago now, where he fabricated one of his uh, metasurface flat lenses. Um, or actually, the student, Amir Arabi, fabricated this, um, again, using the Oxford tools for etching where he made a, an array of amorphous silicon nanopillars on sapphire in order to make a 4.8 micron flat lens. And we were able to get very good collimation with less than a half a degree half angle divergence 
um, and, and very good beam quality from one of our quantum cascade lasers. So that's, that's what I've got. Uh, just hopefully it shows a little bit of how we're using the, these tools to for a, a, a realistic space application. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. I have no, oh wait, this one's working. Was the lapel mic working there? Okay, I wasn't sure. Questions for this one, Oscar. Yeah, we do that here. Yeah, so um, I I do a, a long SF6 clean, a long O2 clean, a long SF6 clean, and then a SF6 O2 clean, running both gases at the same time, about 10 minutes each. Um, do the etch, and then after etching each sample, I perform those clean cleaning steps again because it, I, don't, I don't know if it's accumulation of polymer from the methane, but um, if, the, if the etch doesn't start from a clean state, it uh, tends to, to leave a roughened etch surface behind. So unlike many other etches where you want to run your actual process to condition the chamber beforehand, we just seem to get better results with a clean chamber. So I, I always do a test sample immediately before doing the real lasers, and then uh, and then do the clean, and then do the real lasers. And that you know the variation from you know I'm in the clean room maybe every couple of months doing these <laughs> etches, so there's a lot of time in between, and who knows what went on in the chamber in the intervening time. Um, and there's maybe. Off the top of my head, you know, 20% variation in etch rate for a given structure. Um, but the, you know, the selectivity and the verticality of the etch is, is very consistent. And I don't have a good explanation for why the etch rate would vary that much. <laughs> I knew he would do that. <laughs> Over to you, Mike. Yeah. Yeah, I, the, your use of an etcher is, is such contrast to the, the most studied etchers are the ones that are just on shift and etching day in, day out. That, it's a completely different problem set. And, and I'm certainly marking it when you said we prefer not to do a conditioning plasma, we prefer to do a, a, a nominally clean chamber start. That's good. Um, the, the experimental variables are obvious. I mean, your, your, your power, your gas flow, your pressure are likely to be reproducible. The, the, the primary devices for those are quite good, and, and you'd, you'd notice if there was a fault in any of those. Uh, wafer temperature is the least well controlled. And especially so in our case, because we have these thermally floating chips. So, yeah, maybe, maybe that's... No, I mean, if you wanted to get it more controlled, what you would do would be to make a, uh, a, a better thermal link between your sample and the stage and have the stage at a known temperature rather than rely on plasma heating of the sample. Um, what we've done sometimes uh, at home is use um, fiber optic thermometers, which are RF bomb proof, and, and get those on the front side of samples, um, usually with a little... Um, Alley foil and Kapton tape, very good. Just make a little angled umbrella so that the, um, uh, the flux of species from the plasma isn't hitting the probe straight away. Get the probe bonded with a bit of uh, thermal paste uh, to, to the sample. And then you can get the time constants of your sample and understand the variation a bit better. Uh, that, that's, the kind of, that's the kind of approach if you wanted to bottom that one out. Okay. Guy, can we get one of those? 
fiber optic probe. Well, you just want on your thermal bond, the, the bond is just a pair. That's the thing, none. It's, it's floating. Oh, yeah. Isn't it the process of giving it, you know, you've got the resulting temperature and stuff, and you've got the right power, power and training to use stuff like that? And, and we have got some industrial users who are doing wafers that way, and they quite like it because. Um, most heat transfer techniques involve clamping the wafer. You know, Indium phosphide just loves being clamped, doesn't it? That's a, a, um, you know, just how many Indium phosphide wafers do you want to break in a day? So um, having it not clamped means that you haven't got clamped shadows and you haven't got mechanical stress on your wafer. So uh, provided that the thermal environment is reproducible enough, that, then, it, then it just works quite well. Yeah, if, if we could have a local temperature measurement, I think that would help a lot. Yeah. Okay. Any more? All done with that one. Thank you very much. Thanks.